Hi everybody, Michael Davis here. Welcome to Bone to Pick. And we are coming to you today from Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And uh, we are extremely fortunate to be uh, having the opportunity to spend some time with our featured artist for the month of March, the great Lou Soloff. And uh, I have to say, personally speaking, Lou is one of the most passionate musicians I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Um, he is a prolific jazz artist, having recorded eight CDs as a solo artist. Uh, he's recorded with Miles Davis, Joe Henderson, Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, Wayne Shorter, Clark Terry. He's had a very significant and prolific uh, relationship with the late great Gil Evans and Ornette Coleman. Uh, he's one of the premier, all-time premier studio musicians here in New York, having recorded with Elvis Costello, Frank Sinatra, Lou Reed, Paul Simon, Barbara Streisand, just to name a few. Um, he has recorded on a myriad of uh, motion picture soundtracks and literally thousands of television commercials. And having said all of that, uh, probably his most famous work is uh, now about 45 years old. He played uh, that extremely famous trumpet solo on the great Blood, Sweat and Tears tune Spinning Wheel, a number one hit back when, and uh, I think still one of the most uh, recognizable trumpet solos. So, Lou, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to sit down and talk to us about your extraordinary career in life and music. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that <coughs> I've seen some of your interviews with uh, various other people, um, you know, uh, Randy Brecker, Chris Bodie, Dave Taylor, um, and little excerpts of some of the others, and it's an honor to be included among that list. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lou. That's really nice of you to say. Uh, well, why don't we jump right in and talk about, you grew up in the New York, New Jersey area. Talk about maybe some of your early memories and what made you gravitate to the trumpet early on. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, well, when uh, I, I was brought up in... Um, my first five and a half years or so, I can't remember whether it was five or six, so I'll say five and a half. I was brought up in Brooklyn, various areas, um, Bensonhurst, Flatbush, Sheepshead Bay was the last area. I was born in a Manhattan hospital, but immediately taken to Brooklyn, where I am now. And um, then um, my uncle, my father was a a vaudevillian. He was a tap dancer, oh, wow. and uh, uh, he's uh, in, was in a tap soft shoe dancer in a team called Bud and Buddy, which was um, in vaudeville. And the Bud was Buddy Howe, who later became the head of General Artists Corporation. My father um, was an Agva agent, um, uh, American Guild of Variety Artists, and then my uncle. <laughs> actually won a 20-year lease on a hotel in Lakewood, New Jersey, shooting craps. That's right, <laughs> he did. And my uncle, my father went to work for him, running the nightclub and uh, the bar. My mother was a violinist before she had me, um, and, you know, and she, she used to play uh, in some, with some, you know, behind vaudeville acts and stuff like that. And uh, I'm of Russian-Polish descent, um, and um, my father's family was from Russia, from, um, you can cut all this if you want, but, um, you know. No, it's great was, stuff. Okay. It's really good. He, was, cool. he cool. was from Russia. Uh, I mean, my father's family was from a place called Sevastopol, which was a secret Russian naval base. Um, uh, the original family name was Soloveitchik, um, Russian Jewish, and the, um, the other... Part of, uh, the other part of the family, no, I mean the other side of my father's family was from Minsk, which is in a place called uh, Belarus. And uh, my mother's side of the family was from Łódź, Poland. And um, an ironic thing is that my mother's side of the family was maiden name was Solomon. And my daughter wound up marrying a Solomon, not a Jewish Solomon, but a Solomon. So my daughter still has family name. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing, you know? And I'll open up the interview because I definitely want to say I'm so proud 
that I have two daughters, Laura, who's now living in Houston with her son, with my son-in-law, Daniel, and my daughter, Lena, who is living in the Bronx. And uh, I have two grandchildren by Laura, Mila, who's less than, who was born December 10th of 2013, and, uh, and uh, Micah, who was born uh, four years and seven months ago, uh, June 25th of uh, whatever year it was. <laughs> and uh, I can't help myself, I had to talk about that. But um, getting back to me, um, the reason that it's important that my father went to work in a, in a pretty big hotel was the hotel always had bands. And at that point, every hotel, as later the Catskills had it, every hotel in Lakewood, New Jersey had a Latin band and an American band. For some reason, I gravitated to the Latin band more. One of the reasons might have been that one of the most famous Latin musicians led the band in one of the early things that I heard, and a guy named Noro Morales, who was very, very famous. And um, so when I was five years old, I would hear this. I don't know who the Latin trumpet player was then, but I started, you know, I would hear the American trumpet players. wasn't particularly drawn to the trumpet through that. It wasn't until much later that I found out really why I played the trumpet, which I will which I will tell you in sequence, because as I found it out, because I think it's more interesting that way. Um, <coughs> I played ukulele. My father got me on ukulele when I was about, um, he played ukulele and banjo. Got me on uke when I was about four, no, about uh, five years old. And, and also my mother started me on piano lessons and I studied piano from the age of five to the age of 10 and a half. And um, I was never intrigued with the piano because I think the part of, I have to put part of the thing on the teacher who would always show me the correct fingering positions and this and that, but never really talked about what a musical phrase was about. You know, and I think that's very, very important. It's really about the music. It's not, I mean, how beautiful is da 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 bum? You know, I mean, but that was never talked about. It was just like five, one, two, three, four. You know, it was, so I didn't, I didn't really take to the piano, but, you know, who knows? The reason is probably because I was supposed to find the trumpet. Now I'll get to it. When I was uh, maybe three, four years old, my, my father's parents had in their house 78 records, which I know by the time of five I was able to put on the turntable. And my uncle Jesse, who was a piano player and very influential on me, played me Louis Armstrong record after Louis mm -hmm. Armstrong record from the time I was five years old. And, um, and I completely forgot about this when I was 10, when I took up the trumpet. I completely forgot about it. But I was listening to Louis Armstrong, and I had a favorite record, which he later gave me, which um, is called, I Hope Gabriel Likes My Music. And in this record, he plays a solo, and he talks a lot. And then he says, well, I don't think Gabriel liked that one too much. I'm going to go up there and hit some high ones for you. And he played an F major scale, G major on the trumpet starting on G just above the staff and going up to a high G. But in my memory very clearly, it wasn't a loud screaming high G. It was just beautiful. Just beautiful going up there. That was a big influence on me. And the other record that was a tremendous influence on me was After You've Gone with the Gene Krupa Band featuring Roy Eldridge. I just would play it over and over and over and over. And the same with Louis Armstrong and the reverse side shoe shine boy to some extent. Um, putting it together with, with my later concepts, I have to say, um, the reason I know these records, well, let me go more in sequence. When I was 10 years old, when I was nine, they gave me a, a tonette to play in um, you know, fourth grade. When I was 10, they asked me what instrument I wanted to play. And I picked the trumpet because it was shiny. 
or so I thought. I wanted to play the trumpet because it was shiny. Kind of ironic because from the time I was about 22 or 23 years old, I played a raw brass horn, <laughs> which wasn't shiny at all. And, uh, uh, you know, during all the hits of Blood, Sweat and Tears and all that period. And it wasn't until really a couple of years ago that I started to play a shiny horn. Um, at any rate, trying to go back into context, um, I want to say this right now. When I was about 19 years old, walking home from the Eastman School of Music or walking to Eastman from the dorm, I can't remember which direction, all of a sudden I heard Roy Eldridge's solo from After You've Gone in my head. Note for note, I still saying to myself, that's why I played the trumpet. And I remembered the Louis Armstrong solo. That's why. It isn't because it was shiny, it's because I heard I was fortunate enough to have two of the greatest influences, jazz-wise, that anybody could have when they were young, which was Roy and Lewis. And I went, oh my gosh, that's it. My Uncle Jesse turned me on to Lewis Armstrong. My Uncle Jesse turned me on to Dizzy Gillespie. My Uncle Jesse turned me on to Miles Davis. My Uncle Jesse turned me on to Ornette Coleman. And I'll talk about that yeah. later. Yeah, that's but fantastic. the the But um, uh, important thing, there were two important things about early influences. As I was walking home from college one day, I said, I want to play the trumpet up high, up crazy high. Like, you know, then the double C was the thing. But I said, I want to play up to double C sharp, but not <laughs> loud and high. I want to just be able to use it in my solos like a piano keyboard. And... Uh, when I was younger, I could, <laughs> you know, when well, I was... You, you still can. And that's well, I a, can, but not as consistently as I It's a great way to that. look at it, though. It's a very... But, I mean, uh, really, that's the way I looked at it. Uh, so, there's one other thing I wanted to discuss about the childhood years, and that was when I was about seven years old, before I picked up the trumpet, I had a further influence, which became very important later in my life. I worked as, My father worked a summer in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, at a place called the Pine Point Resort. They had a Latin band. The trumpet player was a guy named Eddie Medina. He was 21 years old at the time. I was seven. And I was taken by his tone. I can still remember his sound playing Magic is the Moonlight. Da 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 da. You know, uh, as I would go to sleep, Bolero. And later, when I did one of my first jobs in New York with Mario Bowser, when I was 21, I was 21, and Mario was asking me about my, and I said, well, I worked, you know, I worked with this, I, I didn't work with, but I was at this resort, and uh, I was influenced by this trumpet player who used to show me how to cheat on pinball machines when I was a kid by, by putting ashtrays under the two front legs so that the ball wouldn't go down <laughs> from the flippers, uh, and his name was, he used to play with me, you know, so we got friendly. And uh, his name was Eddie Medina, and Mario Bowser's eyes got wide, may he rest in peace, and he said, Eddie Medina was the greatest Latin trumpet soloist that ever lived. Wow. So how lucky could I be? <laughs> how lucky could I be? That is awesome. Amazing. Well, Lou, uh, first of all, thanks for all those. That's incredible memories. That, and, that's uh, all. And that, you know, that's, that's the childhood stuff. That's great stuff. Great stuff. Thank you for sharing that. And I was always taken by the Latin bands more than the American bands in the hotels. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we touch briefly now? You, you, uh, you mentioned Eastman, and, and, and as, yeah. as well, you attended the Juilliard School. Um, maybe touch briefly on your college experience sure. and also... You know, it should be noted this was back in the at a time when there weren't jazz programs as, as prevalent as they are now, and I would imagine that Juilliard and Eastman didn't have jazz programs. Maybe okay. you could touch on what those experiences I will, were like. But for you. I'm gonna I went to Juilliard preschool too, so okay. I want to talk about that. Okay. When I was ten and a half, I started the trumpet. Thought it was because it was shiny, but it wasn't. I um, very important to say this. Um, I started to play in about April. Studied with my my band director, uh, Frank Unger. And um, the, the following summer, as my father always worked in hotels, there was a trumpet player named Willie Epstein 
in the band, who was a very good trumpet player and became very famous later in the uh, in the klezma field with a band called the Epstein Brothers. And uh, Willie said he would teach me, my father wanted me to take lessons with him, and he said he would teach me two lessons a week if I promised to practice an hour and a half a day. And I was the kind of kid that if I said I'd do it, I'd do it. So I practiced an hour and a half a day, and of course nobody was doing that when they were 10 years old. <laughs> So I went from last chair in my band to first chair in my band overnight. You know, learned how to double tongue, triple tongue, all this stuff right away. And uh, it's all about practicing. I'll say that a hundred times in this interview if you want. It's all about practicing. But at any rate, you hear that, Zach? <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so at any rate, um, then... My, then I, my mother and father sent me to a music camp called Musicland, which was at Annandale on the Hudson, Bard College. Okay. There were only three boys in the camp, and all the rest were girls. And I was very girl shy. <laughs> Let me tell you, that was some summer for me. So <laughs> at any rate, um, extremely girl shy. So at any rate, the... Now I have two daughters and a granddaughter and a grandson. So at any rate, the, um, the next thing that happened was a bunch of the kids at the camp were involved in Juilliard prep. So I mm. wanted to go to Juilliard prep and my parents sent me. And that's when I met one of the two most important teachers. Um, I mean, I had, I had like more than all my teachers were important. But if, if I could say I had two or three most important teachers in my life, it was Ed Troidel. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Willie Epstein, I have to conclude him. And, um, and later, from the Chicago Symphony, um, Arnold Jacobs and Adolf Herseth. Mm -hmm. But um, at that point in my life, Ed Troidel took me under his wing and taught me in a way that I appreciate now, which was, he said, not only do I care what you sound like, but what you're doing to produce the notes, because I don't want you to be one of these guys that goes out with the Kenton band when he's 19 and is through playing when he's 21, because he plays wrong. You have to learn how to play the correct way so that you don't hurt yourself when you play. And later, Arnold Jacobs reinforced that with the breathing, explaining something very critical, that, um, that after the age of 50, about the age of 50, there was a natural reduction in the, organ, in the inner organs of the body. So that if you didn't breathe correctly, a lot of players lose a lot when they turn around 50 because they don't breathe correctly. So through my breathing exercise that I learned from Jake and the Ambusher things that I learned from Troidel, I'm still able to play, which is, you know, um, I'm, I was just lucky to be taught that way. So getting into the college years, I uh, auditioned for three colleges. I auditioned, no, I didn't audition for three colleges. I only auditioned for Eastman. It's the only school I uh, auditioned for. I took Troidel's advice and I only was interested in the schools where he liked the trumpet teacher. And he liked the trumpet teacher at Oberlin, and he liked the trumpet teacher at Eastman, Sid Meier, who I wound up studying with, and he liked the, the uh, and of course, Juilliard. But he warned me, he said, Juilliard, he said, you're not gonna get more than $400 a year. He said, because the only, he says, Alan Rubin, who was my, my lifelong buddy, I mean, he, you know, he was my, my, I, I, I have several friends that I consider my best friends, but if any of them was ever my best friend, it was Alan for 51 years from the time I was 16 years old until he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, still hard talking about him. Yeah, that was certainly a big loss for, for all of us and you in particular. I know you guys are extremely close. Alan was, he was at Juilliard, right? When, when Alan you went to Juilliard, and I think he got $400. So my teacher said, 
Well, if Alan got 400, you're not going to get more than three. <laughs> I, I think he said that, you know, three or four tops, you know, because Alan was a wizard. When he was 16 years old, he played like he was 40. Mm. It was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Really, truly was. But anyway, my father didn't have a lot of money. And um, I auditioned for Eastman. And I have to say, attitude is so important. I t tell that to all of you. For some reason, I had no doubt that I would get into Eastman. No doubt whatsoever. And I got a full scholarship for four years. I mean, they called it financial aid, which, you know, which it was. Um, 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 uh, but it was full tuition. At that point, tuition was $1,175 a year, <laughs> you know, and uh, four years was $4,700. Not quite like that now, is it, Mike? It's kind of a touch. Yeah, touch, a little Just touch, a bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but at any rate, I, I got it. I loved Eastman. To be honestly frank, I'll tell you about my experiences there, but I wish that I had come to New York after two years there and studied at Juilliard or Manhattan because I would have gotten in a mm. little earlier. Mm. Um, I, when I learned that I had a fantastic time at Eastman, um, I thought, you know, when I went to Eastman, I thought I was like, you know, I was the best trumpet player my age that I knew. But when I went to Eastman, I had a shock coming to me. <laughs> because, or except Alan, who was a year older than me, who could play the trumpet much better than me, you know. And, and, uh, and he liked the way I played, so it went both ways. So then I went to Eastman, and all of a sudden, there's this guy up there, Ed Lewis, who could double tongue on different notes. And I thought that was impossible. I thought it was impossible, so it became impossible for me. Remember that, whoever's watching this. <laughs> If you don't think something's impossible, it's not. My good friend Sergei Nikaryakov told me that his, t his father taught him and told him there's no limit to what you can do. And if you haven't heard that man play, please do. He is beyond belief. And then there was another kid there who could play much more trumpet than I could named Tor Ramstead. I don't know what Tor is doing, but Ann and I are still friends, still very good friends. And um, we had such fabulous times in co college. is such a blast. And I'm glad I went to Eastman and wasn't in the city and was really up there. You're, you were Eastman, mm -hmm. weren't you, Mike? Yeah, I was, yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, the wind ensemble was, I, I don't know if I ever played in the wind ensemble. I don't remember. I might have. I can't remember that. I think I did for... I'm not sure, but I know I played in, this, in the school symphony orchestra. And I have an interesting story that I'll tell that's coming to mind. When I was a freshman, my, my trumpet teacher, Sid Meier, asked me to audition for the Philadelphia Symphony. They were coming up there. And I said, what are you, crazy? I can't play, I couldn't do, get that job, you know? I said, maybe, maybe in four or five years. And he looked at me and he winked at me and he said, maybe you won't be as good in four or five years, <laughs> you know. But, but, <clears throat> but I was always frightened. One of the things that drove me to not play orchestral or classical music is I couldn't stand it when conductors would look at you like this. <laughs> You know, like, you will yeah. play that note yeah. now, that exact note, the exact way I want you to play it. Play it. <clears throat> That's what I thought it was. I really thought it was fear of that, because I was encouraged by many people that said I could have been a very good uh, orchestral player. Um, and uh, one friend of mine wanted, me to, wanted to train me, to audition me, to get me into the Philharmonic after I, after I got out of Blood, Sweat, and Tears. But um, that was Vince Panzarella. <laughs> he said, Lou, come on, man, you know. But I had fallen in love with improvising to the point where I knew in order to play classical trumpet well enough to play in a major symphony, 
which would be the only kind of a symphony I'd want to play in, because I like to play with great musicians, which I get to do all the time now in the field I'm in. Mm -hmm. I would have to give up playing the other thing. For that, you must specialize to play that that well, to play it on the level of a, of a, of a Phil Smith or something like that, or a, you know, or, or I mean, Herseth, you know, who knows, but what I'm saying is you have to give the other stuff up because it interferes. There's different ways of playing a trumpet. The way you play lead is completely different than the way you would play first trumpet in a symphony orchestra. You play much larger equipment to get a bigger sound. And even if you're capable of playing little equipment, even if you're capable of playing gigantic equipment like a couple of trumpet players are, uh, and playing lead. I know three lead players that do that. Um, Frank Green, Bijan Watson, um, and the other guy is not a lead player. He's one of the most phenomenal trumpet players in the world, uh, Arturo Sandoval. Arturo can play louder than me, buzzing into his hand, than I can on the trumpet. You know, <laughs> I'm serious. But, but on the other hand, we have one of the greatest trumpet players in the world, John Faddis, who always played small equipment and encouraged me to go to smaller equipment to play high notes, which I did later, which I'll talk about too. Mm -hmm. But in college, I played in the, I, Sid asked me to audition. I didn't audition, but when one of the trumpet, when Boyd Hood, who plays in the LA Philharmonic, got sick and couldn't go with the, uh, uh, couldn't play the Carnegie Hall concert when the Eastman Phil Philharmonia came back on freshman year and they needed to get somebody to come into the orchestra and play with the Philharmonia, Sid sent me into the orchestra. Mm. Now, I didn't play first, but I played with the Philharmonia when I was a freshman on, uh, on the stage of Carnegie Hall. But I, I have to keep going back to this because Bud Herseth said to me, he honestly believed that whatever your first live things that you heard would be, your, would be your influence on what you wanted to do. And the first live things I heard were these great Latin trumpet players playing. And the Louis Armstrong records were the first thing I heard. I didn't hear like Bud heard. The first thing he heard was a concert of Strauss waltzes with a symphony. So that's what he mm -hmm. wanted to do. The thing I heard were the combo trumpet players. And so I finally realized that's what I want to do. And I loved the freedom of improvisation. I loved it. I couldn't give it up to become a principal trumpet in a major symphony, which, I mean, could have, should have, would have, you know, but I think I had the capability to do it if I wanted to. But I could only if I would give everything up to do it. And I couldn't do that. So superseding the fear of playing with a conductor that would go like that to me was the love of what I'd heard out of Louis Armstrong and Roy Eldridge and things like that, that I couldn't give up. I think that's what drove me into the field that I'm in. Uh, what else happened of great importance in college? My, my, my roommate, no, one of my best friends in college was a guy named George Berry, who at age 18, right after his freshman year, was called to sub as the principal bassoon in the, in the St. Louis Symphony and remained there and I think just retired mm. all these years with the St. Louis Symphony. Uh, George Berry was his name. Um, I met Chuck Mangione when I was in college. That's very important. He was a very heavy influence on me. Um, the first thing was I could play the trumpet better than Chuck. I could play the trumpet better. I'm just talking about the mechanics of the instrument. I couldn't understand why he could improvise so much better than me if I could play the trumpet better than him. I didn't get it. But eventually, I got it, and uh, through his help and through the help of a drummer who is deceased, 
named Veni Ruggiero, who taught me the basics of who to listen to when I played jazz. This all happened to me in college. I said, well, who should I listen to? And he said, you listen to Miles. And he was talking about bebop, which is a particular kind of jazz that, you know, happened there. And it's kind of like, I would consider it, Michael, like the classical music of jazz. Mm -hmm. It's the basics. It's, mm -hmm. it's really the basics of it and the basics of a lot of things that came after it. And what Louis Armstrong played was the basics before bebop, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe, honestly, the only thing we can really do well is reflect the music of our own times. I'm never going to be as great a bebop player as the great bebop players. The only thing I can do is be the best Lou that I can be. That's my only shot. It's the only shot for any, any serious improviser. And I also, I also object to the term jazz in a certain way because it's music. It's just music. And, you know, the musicians themselves didn't call it jazz. They called it music. Uh, way back, I remember reading that Duke Ellington wanted it to be called black music. And at that time, it certainly was. But it has evolved into a world music influenced by Latin music, influenced by Indian music, influenced by Western classical music. It has really, well, it's always been influenced by Western classical music, but it's really become a world music. And, um, you know, at this point in time, you know, of course, thinkers like Gil Evans and Miles Davis always heard him, but it took thinkers like them to get me to listen to and appreciate to artists like Jimi Hendrix and Prince and people like that. But I finally got it. And um, uh, I know I'm flitting around, but that's the way my mind works. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, Lou, that first of all, we're, I think all of us who are fans of your playing are glad you took that uh, fork in the road uh, and went to in the jazz end of things as opposed to, I know that you could have been and are a great classical player, but we appreciate that. But let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, when you got back to New York. Now we're talking 1965 and you began what was, you know, at that time was, you didn't know it, but it was going to become one of the great freelance careers ever of a, an instrumentalist in New York. And maybe take us through those, those first few years. And I know you wanted to, to mention a few people in particular, Vincent Lopez, uh, Machido, uh, your time at Radio City Music Hall. And I know you have a couple good stories with Maynard Ferguson and Doc Severinsen, okay. so maybe you could just brief, okay. briefly go over all, all of those amazing uh, okay. experiences. Okay. Well, remember when I said I auditioned for Eastman, I had no doubt I was going to get in. I had no doubt. I didn't, I just figured that's what I do. You know, I'm a trumpet. I also never had any doubt that I would m make it. I never had any doubt because I always thought of myself as less talented than most people. So I worked harder than most people because I thought I was less talented. When I was in college, one other thing I want to say about college, when I was in college, I realized I wasn't less talented because I was blessed with and I'm thankful for a really good ear. So that the talent is that, the really good ear. But I've never met a trumpet player who plays better trumpet than me. Talking about the instrument, I've never met one that didn't practice more than me. Never. Hmm. I practiced a lot. So, you know, I can play the thing. Um, but I never met anybody who, who played it better than me that didn't practice it more. It's a simple equation. It's really a mm -hmm. simple equation. Yeah, indeed. You know, and, and uh, uh, everybody says, oh my God, that guy's this, that guy's that. Well, of course there are geniuses. I mean, like, like Sergei. Sergei starts to play at nine years old, and I don't care how much you practice. To give you a first performance of the Aratunian when you're ten and a half, when you start when you're <laughs> nine, 
You know, yeah. that's something weird there. Game, I'm sorry. Game, set, match even, on that Even one. though he doesn't think he's a genius. <laughs> sorry, Sergey. You know, <laughs> I think you are. And, you know, and several other friends of mine. But the, the other thing is that, um, so I come to New York and, um, um, and my teacher Troidel says to me, when you get to New York, I'll introduce you to Bob Swan. He's the contractor at Radio City, you know, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get you in there. So they have auditions. Now I have to tell you, I figured I'm in because my teacher knows Bob Swan. He called him, I'm in. <laughs> okay? So I'm not nervous. If I knew who I was auditioning against, I would have been petrified and never been able to play that audition. There were players that became principles and major symphonies and all these kind of things that I was against. Uh, you know, I didn't think about them. And in those days, I was very, very, in the very lean minority of people that could play lead and improvise too. And could play some classical stuff too. There were very few people that could do that. Now, many, many people can do it. Uh, anyway, basically, I, I was one of the top people in the audition. I wasn't able to take the job right away when it was offered to me because my uncle also, my uncle Jesse had recommended me to Vincent Lopez where I worked at the Taft Hotel. That was one of the funniest jobs I ever did in my <laughs> life. Vincent Lopez was the guy who wrote NOLA. And that was the break tune. The band consisted of whatever the band was. You know, like uh, there was one trumpet and about one or two saxophones, drummer. You know, I mean, some of the guys played with Tommy Dorsey. It was a good band. And, um, <clears throat> and we worked nine weeks there. And at that point... I didn't hate anything. I loved anything where I had the horn in my mouth was fine with me. Oh, this, it was the timing. It was all night, it was 20 minutes on, 10 minutes off. And there was one guy, his name, well, anyway, there was one guy <laughs> whose job was only to time the sets. That's all he did. He timed 20 <laughs> minutes off, 10 minutes. I mean, 20 minutes on, 10 minutes off. Okay. So uh, you can edit some of this stuff, but I'm telling you some <laughs> of this stuff is funny, Mike. So, and every time we ended a set, it would be. So I had two subs. I, I had to miss two times. One time I held an Alan Rubin to sub. And Alan Rubin was a noted wise guy in the recording <laughs> studios. He was ludicrously handsome. He was movie star handsome when he was young, really, truly. And um, he was very intelligent and with a kind of a sense of humor, second only probably to Don Rickles in that kind of humor. <laughs> You knew him a little bit, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I said to Alan, I said, okay, Alan, you got to come in and cover me. Now, Alan could sight read better than me, and I was a really, really good sight reader, really good at that point. I was one of the better sight readers. Alan could out sight read me. And he was quick-minded, and he said, I said, Alan, there's no drinking on the bandstand and there's no smoking on the bandstand. Okay? So Alan goes in and covers for me. <laughs> and the next night, the guys say to me, um, the guy did a great job, but you can never send him in again. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I said, didn't he play well? He says, he played great. It was unbelievable. But every single set, he had a martini on the bandstand and a cigarette. <laughs> every single... Now, if that isn't Alan, 
Okay, the other <laughs> sub I sent in, may they both rest in peace. Um, the other sub I sent in was a young player who scared, I don't know if you can use this word, but if you can use it, leave it in. If not, I'll say an alternative. Scared the shit out of me when I heard him play. Can I use that word in there? Absolutely. Okay. He scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Mike Lawrence. Mm. When he was 19 years old and I was 21, I met him and I heard him play and he did that to me. He was phenomenal. And uh, I sent him in to sub. And he kept the tape of me describing what to do. He kept the tape of the phone call with me giving him the instructions about playing <laughs> NOLA and this and that. And he loved it. He laughed so hard about it. He went and he did a very good job. <laughs> and while I was working with Vincent Lopez, I started working with Machito. Because in the interim of this, when I was 15 years old, I started to work in the Catskill Mountains. It's a very important thing I didn't mm -hmm. mention. Mm -hmm. When I was 15, a band leader named Max Schilling, who was the brother of a band leader that my father knew named Phil Schilling, uh, offered me a summer job. My trumpet teacher said I couldn't go away for less than $25 a week. My father secretly was ready to say to the guy, if you can't pay him $25, i will pay the money because I want him to have this experience. Mm. But the guy paid me $25 a week. It wound up being $2105 after taxes. <laughs> okay? And I played. It was me and my drummer friend from high school who passed away named Gilbert Fields, who was terrific. And uh, Max was a trio. And Max was great because he'd let me make my own mistakes. I would play tunes out of the Facebook fake book and I would play something that was unplayable at a temple and he would say, I want you to do that. I wanted you to find out. Anyway, I did a summer with him. Then I did uh, two summers with his brother, Phil. And then I did uh, two summers at the Laurels Hotel, which was a big gig. And that was... Uh, I had studied with Carmine Caruso then. And Carmine, I could always play up to a high D concert on the trumpet, E on the trumpet, but I couldn't touch an F and I could play an E consistently. I studied with Carmine Caruso and all of a sudden he got my range up there. Mm -hmm. And I played my first high F playing behind Tony Bennett at the Laurels Hotel in, um, in when, you know, when I was about 17 years old. Um, and then I finished up, I subbed for Alan preseason at the Homoac, where my two roommates, when we were 19 years old, were Bob Mann, who at that point played guitar and trumpet, fabulous musician, we're still friends, and Steve Schaefer, who we're st I'm still friends with. So that was, uh, you know, we were in this band at the Homoac, and then I did my summer with Danny Leroy was his name. His real name was Danny Lapidus at the uh, Kutcher's Hotel in the Catskills where I played with some really great musicians. Morty Reed, Morty Lewis was once, mm. was one, uh, whose uh, who's ex-wife, his widow is still a jingle singer. And uh, Joe Lopes, who was a great LA player who started that saxophone group where they play all the bird solos together. And, um, Joe, I can still see him smiling at me with he had a thing in between his front teeth. He knew that I couldn't, he knew that I couldn't play a high F. So he purposely wrote one for me and he would smile if I would miss it. He would turn around and smile at me if I would miss it. Um, but this is the way you learn, you know, this is the way you learn. And uh, during that summer, I met uh, Cameron Brown, and Don Perillo, mm. two great musicians that, uh, anyway, okay, the Catskills are over, I'm in New York, I'm playing with Vincent Lopez, oh, the reason I mentioned the Catskills mainly, what got me there is, one of the, the last summer I was with the, cat at the uh, 
with uh, at the Kutches, the band opposite was a Latin band, and the first trumpet player in the band, again may he rest in peace, was a guy named Paquito. They called him Paquito. Um, Frank Davila was his name, and he was the lead trumpet player with Machito. Machito was, to me, the greatest Latin big band there ever was. It was so deep musically. Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie recorded with it. And he said, I like the way you play. You call me when you come to New York, I'm going to get you on Machito's band. So I called him. I'm 21 years old. I call him. Gets me right on Machito's band. Mm. And Mario Bowser, one of the things he said to me, he says, Louis, he says, you sound Spanish. It was because of my influence of Eddie Medina mm -hmm. and hearing all the Latin bands in the hotels. And the other thing he said to me was, he says, I know what you're doing. You played classical music. I know what you're doing. I didn't know he was the you know, principal clarinetist in the Havana Philharmonic, whatever mm. it was. He said, the pitch there is lower. The pitch here is higher. So I learned that. Um, so I was with Machito. I remember one night with Machito. It was thrilling for me. Uh, Paquito said to me, he said, Louis, he said, next week, we used to work at a Bronx casino up on 149th in the Grand Concourse. He said, Louis, next week, I want to take you somewhere after the job. I want you to hear something. I said, OK. So the job was over at 2 in the morning. So he takes me to hear an after hours thing, Tito Rodriguez's band, starting at three in the morning with a young Victor Paz playing lead. Mm. I could not believe it. He was unbelievable. Victor was mm. unbelievable. I got to play with uh, Tito Rodriguez one time. And then, you know, so all these times happened. It was so thrilling to play with Machito. And I would, during this time, I would play with a lot of rehearsal bands. Howard McGee had a rehearsal band. Chris Swanson had a rehearsal band. And people like Joe Henderson would come up to the rehearsal, and I would be scared out of my mind to play <laughs> in front of him. Can you imagine? I mean, in those days, you see, in the, in the days when, Mike, when you were coming up, even when you were coming up, I think some of these guys would come out and do a clinic at your school. Mm -hmm. But in the days I was coming up, you never had any contact with these guys. No contact whatsoever. Mm. You know, you, you, there was no contact. So, um, so it was like, all of a sudden, this is the guy on the back of the record. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, this is the guy on the back of the record. And um, so, I, I went there, you know, and I met Charlie Camilleri in one of these bands. I think it was Chris's band, but I can't remember. Martin Banks, Charlie Camilleri, and me, I think were the trumpet section of Chris Swanson's band. And I remember that Pepper Adams, who I never realized how these guys I played with, I never realized how incredible they were. And uh, Pepper, turns around looks and he looks at the trumpet section he says I can't believe that trumpet that that's the trumpet section between Charlie and Martin and me who are all like well I would say thank heaven characters <laughs> so uh, at any rate um, um, I believe Dave Gale used to play with Chris Swanson's band too at some points but Chris Swanson was a hell of a band. It's where I met Bobby Porcelli. Mm. No, Bobby Porcelli I met in the mountains. My first apartment in New York was on 82nd and Broadway. And it was gotten for me by Bobby Porcelli and Marty Scheller. And we all lived in the same apartment building. I'd like to tell you one incident that happened. I was in a five-floor five walk-up, and they had to remove the two red light bulbs that were in the in the first room of my apartment because that's where the two hookers that <laughs> lived there before me were. Okay? I had I had a the furniture in my apartment, I had a hot plate, I had a bed, I had a $35 RCA 
record player, <laughs> right? That's all I had. And, um, but you know, with that, my rent was $70 a month. And when Alan Rubin came up to look at my apartment with the floors crooked one way and the ceilings crooked another way and the windows crooked another way, I said, do you think it's worth 70 a month, Alan? Alan said, did you say seven? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, so, you know, I was there. And in that apartment was where, during my first year in New York, at one point, I got a phone call from Maynard Ferguson. And I might have gotten one from Doc Severinsen too. But I remember very clearly with Maynard Ferguson, when he said, hi, Lou, it's Maynard Ferguson, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I went, yeah, sure. And I hung up the phone on him because <laughs> I didn't really believe it was him. And then somebody called me back and said, Maynard wanted you to go out with him. So I went out with Maynard. Uh, well, wow, that's some, some awesome it's uh, fabulous stories, stories and, uh, it? and memories. It's, it is. Uh, so so anyway, during this period of time, Charlie told me about jam sessions with Tony Scott down at the Dom, which was uh, be, uh, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue on St. Mark's Place. So I would go down and I would make jam sessions. Everybody made these jam sessions from Freddie Hubbard to Jack D. Jeanette. Everybody played wow. at these jam sessions. And out of the guys who played, Joe Henderson and Kenny Dorham formed a big band. We would rehearse five days a week, three hours a day at the Dom. The band, the names in the band were ludicrous. Hmm. I can tell you the trumpet section was Tommy Tarantine and Mike Lawrence and uh, the guy who's called Kamau now, who was called Charlie Sullivan then. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and myself, and I can't remember the fifth right now. There were five trumpets, but I know it was Mike, Kamau, uh, Charlie Camilleri. That was the fifth. Charlie Camilleri was the fifth trumpet. And I can still hear KD playing Felicidad. I can imitate his tone. And back when I was in college, I told you, Vinnie Ruggiero had told me to listen to three trumpet players. He told me to listen, you know, to learn bebop. He told me to listen to Dizzy. He told me most of all to listen to Charlie Parker. And he said to listen to Dizzy and Miles and Kenny Dorham. And man alive, Kenny was something else. And to hear Joe Henderson play. So here I was, the lead trumpet player up in Chris Swanson's band which was filled with, and I, no, I was the jazz trumpet player in Chris Swanson's band. And downtown, I was the lead trumpet player in Joe Henderson's band, afraid to improvise one note in front of those guys. Would not do it. Would not do it. And Then one day, we're all playing a gig uptown in Harlem somewhere, and Joe asks all the trumpet players to, sh to play, to, to, so to trade off. And uh, after I played, it was one of the big compliments of my life that I'll say just because, to show how important it is to have confidence. Joe said, don't you ever, don't you ever dare not play in my band again, <laughs> you know? And so then, then he, would, he would wanted me to solo in his band along with the other guys. And then, um, but I remember one time that we were playing with, with uh, Joe and Johnny Coles. Johnny Coles was Gil Evans' first trumpet player. I mean, the first soloist, or one of them, the early soloists on or early Gil Evans records. Johnny Coles played so great, starting off a trumpet trade, that none of the other guys were willing to play after him. We just went, forget it. No one would play after him. That's how deep what he played was. Out of, <clears throat> out of Joe Henderson, Kenny Dorham rehearsals came for me the first opportunity to play with Elvin Jones. Elvin used to come to rehearsals. And uh, I'll tell it in very much brief. Elvin said, Hey, Lou, why don't you come down 
I'm playing the five spot and bring you a horn. <laughs> right? So I said, okay, Mr. Jones. Right? Now, he'd never heard me improvise a note, but he didn't have to because a mind like that, they can tell by talking to you what you can mm. do. That, that, there's, there are people like that who know what you can do from speaking with you, from hearing you play a lead part. So I was nervous as hell. There was a line. The line was so long of horn players because he was very generous that way, waiting to sit in with Elvin, that it looked like, if anybody's familiar with New York, there's a store on Zabar's, which is a big delicatessen, where they sell smoked salmon and fish and a lot of stuff, and you take a ticket to be online, kind of like Whole Foods now. The line of horns waiting to play with him, to sit in on a blues or whatever it was, looked like a line waiting to buy fish at Zabar's. <laughs> that struck me when I was 21. And one of the one of the people online was another lifelong friend of mine who's a great player, Ronnie Cuber. I remember him being on that line. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get on the line because I... I'm very proud to say I had enough sense to say, there's enough horns up there, you know? <laughs> and so, sec at the bar in between, I went up, Mr. Jones, you told me to bring my horn. Yeah, okay, man. I gotta come up the second set. So the second set, in the middle, he looks at me and he says, oh, well, let's do some autumn leaves. Now, 21, you know, I'm in my prime as far as being able to play the horn. Uh, and autumn leaves I know, but I couldn't play the trumpet nearly as well as usual because I was so nervous. But I couldn't play a wrong note because whatever note I played, they made it the right note, the <laughs> rhythm section. Because Mike, you know who the rhythm section was? No. It was Elvin Jones on drums, McCoy Tyner on piano, and Paul Chambers on bass. There wasn't a note I could, every time I played a note, Paul and McCoy made it the right note. They made it the right note. And that to me is the key of what improvising is really about. It's not an individual effort, it's a group effort, it is a conversation. The people who do it best converse, they don't play solos. Mm. That's really deeply the way I feel. The experience of playing in that band, man, and playing with Howard McGee, and going around and sitting in with this guy and that guy, and what was around then, and then going out and getting a call, my first big call was to play with Maynard. That was my first, I mean, I didn't realize how big it was a call to play with Joe and Kenny. Mm -hmm. That was every bit as big, but I didn't realize it because Maynard was a childhood idol of mine. And I went to play with him and he became a lifelong friend. He, he was a very, very nice man. And I can still remember him introducing a tune at, uh, in Philadelphia, the club we played at saying that there's a request from the Marquis de Sade for Frame for the <laughs> Blues, right? So we would play Frame for the Blues. And also, I remember, I only did a week with him there, a week in Boston, and uh, a few weekends at the Village Gate, where um, the, the trumpet section was John Eckert, Marvin Stam, and me, and I can't remember. Marvin did one of the weekends, because we were talking about it. We just worked together this weekend. Mm -hmm. And... Um, at any rate, the um, funny how things work out, isn't it? <laughs> so the the uh, you know I mean it was really funny. I haven't worked with Marvin in so many years, and last night we were playing a gig, but we'll get up to last night. So <laughs> at at any rate, the uh, we were playing together this weekend. I don't think Marvin was there this particular night, but there was one night when Maynard hit a high note. He hit an E flat above double high C that was so huge that the only way I could conceive of describing it is to say it was like 15 trumpet players in a row <laughs> all hitting that note at the same time. <laughs> and to give you another idea about how one of my idols, Maynard Ferguson, I want to talk about him, to tell you how really great he was. Particularly, you know, I didn't even play with him in his prime. I only played with him in the 60s. His prime was in the up to the late 50s. So Maynard, 
Many years later, I played a tribute to Miles Davis with Maynard, right? And I had a very heavy horn with four valves, so I could play extremely loud on it. Now, I'm not saying I can't even touch the volume of John Faddis now, but this horn was so big and loud that I used to play, there were seven trumpets. And it was John, myself, Randy Brecker, Jimmy Owens, Richard Williams, somebody I can't remember. So I always forget one person, then Maynard. <laughs> I remember talking to my, my former wife, Emily Mitchell, a great harpist. I remember talking to her. She, we were married at the time after the concert. And Gil Evans, who was my main musical influence. And then I'm like, I'm going to have, my, I'm gonna have you direct me and we'll move through this faster. <laughs> so we're talking to Gil Evans, which is the most important teacher outside of Louis Armstrong I ever had. And um, there were seven trumpets playing with Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, and Tony Williams. And we were each given four choruses of blues to play in tribute to Miles. So of course, each one of us played everything we could in the four choruses. So after the concert, I say to Emily, I said, Emily, did I project? Could you hear me? And Emily says, oh yeah, you projected, you projected better than anyone until Maynard worked out, walked out. When Maynard, <laughs> when Maynard walked out, you couldn't hear any of the rest of you. That was just his gift. It was just his gift. But now John can play like eight, thousand times louder than me. I know. I mean, John is the most, oh, he's just incredible. But that night, that's what was happening. And the, um, um, and then Gil said to me, he said, Lou, he said, I hated all seven trumpets. He said, <laughs> he said, all you guys just try to play everything you knew. I wish somebody would have just held a low F sharp through all four choruses. <laughs> So that was my teacher. And what he tried to teach me was not to use technical display for its own sake. Yeah. Lou, I'm, I got I got not to interrupt. I'm I, I'm I, got, I, got, I'm no, I want to share one thing, uh, a personal experience of mine. I don't know if you remember this concert, but I was a student at Eastman and we were trying to raise money to go for the band to go to the Montreux Festival. And uh, Ray Wright was the director and we had this, what ended up being called the Super Trumpets concert. And we had... Uh, Alan Vizzuti, uh, Jeff Tysig, Vince DiMartino, and yourself. Of course I remember. And uh, it was an amazing concert, and we all loved it because the, uh, all, three, uh, all four of your amazing players and the other three guys sounded so phenomenal, but they were definitely trying to out-trumpet each other, and it was pretty spectacular. It came time for your solo. You must have learned from that night you're talking about because you played the most musical thing I've ever heard, and you came in like, I'm not going to out trumping anybody even though you certainly could no i couldn't and and not with, not with, and, with, oh, there, no. <laughs> anyway it just struck all of us in the band we were like wow what a cool that was like so musical so i just wanted to tag Thank on you. to the end of, um, of your story you. let's jump ahead because i know a lot of people want to hear your your insight and your feelings about your time with blood sweat and tears you were with them from 1968 to 1973 i believe yeah and um, um okay. can you just talk about what your time was on bs and yes. um, how that evolved. I think Randy might have had something to do with your I'll relationship. You, but I'll tell you about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, when, you know, Freddie Lipschitz was a friend of all of us. He was a jazz musician out of New York and a fabulous musician. And um, I, got, I, I wish I had time for the stories about that band, but I don't. Hysterical, <laughs> I'll tell you sometime. But... Anyway, Freddie called me and a bunch of other people way earlier than when Blood, Sweat and Tears was first being germinated. And we all said no, because nobody was interested in playing rock. Everybody was only interested in playing jazz. There's one guy who, who to me, is still one of my best buddies. I can't tell you. Uh, all I can tell you is that on the day of his own wedding, to give you the kind of guy this guy is, the day of his own wedding, which was February 20th, some years ago, uh, his first wedding. <laughs> he, out of his groom's suit, produced a birthday card to me. And that was Randy Brecker. 
mm. who, again, there are some guys I love so much it affects me, as you can see. And he's one. Mm. Um, and he's still with us and going strong. He's a real inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. And um, anyway... Where was I going with this? With your, Rand, that's what, yeah, so, of Randy's course. Relationship with the okay. As well. So, Randy being the, the um, excuse me, Randy being the forward thinker that he always has been, said yes to playing the uh, rock stuff. So, there were many trumpet players asked that turned it down. Actually, the very first trumpet player I asked was Paul LaTrenta, who, you know, I don't know what he's doing now, but he was the first trumpet player I asked and, um, to play lead. Wound up being Jerry Weiss, who sounded great, by the way, back then. He really sounded great because I heard him. I, recently, somebody sent me tapes of the first gig I ever did with the band and of some of the early uh, gigs with, with the other band, with Randy and Jerry. Anyway, the band makes this record called Child is Father to the Man, which I think is one of the classic rock records ever made, especially mm -hmm. with horns. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I am particularly turned on by Jimmy Fielder, the bass player, mm. particularly by the way he plays on a track called I Can't Quitter, which remains my favorite song I ever played with the band. So... When Randy decides to go with Horace Silver, uh, Freddie calls me up and says, well, so do you want to join the band? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, let me come and check it out. And I talked to Randy about it, and I've seen an interview where Randy says, I didn't want to do it, but he coerced me into doing it. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there's stuff that's private I can't say. But there is some stuff that I can say, and one of them is that when Randy was with the band, they were a hired horn section. They were making $200 a week back in 1968, 67-68. When they hired us, they couldn't afford to pay us $200 a week, so they had to pay us $100 a week and make us partners. <laughs> mm. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, well, in the end, I got screwed anyway. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that um, I made a lot of money for a while with that band, and uh, and the it was very important. But anyway, getting to what Randy said, he said, "Well, Lou," he said, "You know, said you'll be able to turn down the shit you really don't want to do." because you'll have this $200 a week, you know? <laughs> and uh, I, I said, he, he right away said to me, it wasn't, like, it wasn't like you could stretch out all the time, which is what we like to do. And a lot of people misinterpret that into thinking, oh, I want to play and show off. It isn't that. It's about creative expression. That's truly what it's about, creative expression. Uh, so anyway, I joined... I went to the first rehearsal and I heard David Clayton Thomas sing and he blew me out of the water. Mm -hmm. I could not believe how great that man sung. And I went up to him and I said, I'll tell you what, you were going to make it with or without this band. It was, he was shockingly good. And then we played the Cafe Yo Go Go. And I still really didn't, wasn't, you know, I, there wasn't enough room on the band. It wasn't loose enough. It was too, but the band sounded great because everybody in the band was playing, except me at that point, was playing like it was the last gig they were going to ever play, which mm -hmm. is the way you should play every gig. Mm -hmm. Everybody should play every gig that way. You know, like you got to put everything you got into it. And I was... I was, but I still wasn't convinced it was what I wanted to do. But I always put everything I got into it when I play. It's one of the natural gifts I have mm -hmm. is to do that. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, 
all of a sudden, you know, Clive Davis comes backstage after the thing. I'm wearing a Nehru shirt, and I know I don't dress like this, but you know, somebody bought me some clothes to wear on there, and uh, he says, I mean, just to give me an idea of where money was at that point, he says, "You guys gonna be making fifteen hundred dollars a week before you make it," and my friends and I looked at her and says what the hell would you do with that kind of money? You know, <laughs> what would you do with that kind of money? You know, and uh, so at any rate, all of a sudden, we start to get hot. And I say, I'm in. And then I still remember Bobby saying to me, ha, he said, anybody can be bought. And, you know, I have to admit, there was truth in what he said. There was truth in what he said, and I'm not a complete purist like Gil Evans was. He was a mm -hmm. rarity. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, anybody got 25 grand a week from me, you got me. I don't <laughs> care what kind of music it is, you got me, you hear me? But what I'm saying is, I mean, basically the purists are the ones that really win out. They're few and far between. The ones that won't play something, but you know, I have to say, even though it was never the music that I really, really loved, I think it played a very important part in the history of rock and roll, especially horns and rock and roll. And I will go on record of saying, I think the band should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for what it did. And I am very thankful to the band for putting me on the map as far as my name is concerned. Now I know everybody's, even though for me personally, it wasn't, enough creatively with enough creative room for me and finally when I finally got the nerve to quit the band after about five years four months two weeks three days and like 17 <laughs> minutes I was no I finally was able to quit the band but I don't know if I would have ever quit it if we remained on the top of the heap like we were but you know but for me it was a true blessing that it didn't mm -hmm. because I had to go on and do other things I had to do and to develop as an artist. What I learned personally from it is that money and fame is not really what makes you happy. What makes you happy is doing something that you really want to do and really believe in doing it. Although in the same breath that I'm saying this, I'm not saying I'm not ungrateful because the name I created with that band made it possible for me to do a lot of what I've done. It really did. Mm -hmm. But whereas during the years with the band, um, you can cut this or not, during the Four years, I, the, I never did any drugs outside of marijuana, which is now at the verge of becoming legal, which I think it should be, even though I haven't personally smoked since 73 or maybe 72. I haven't smoked at all because it interferes with my abilities to play the trumpet. It's certainly a hell of a lot less harmful than cigarettes, mm -hmm. you know. Of course. And, uh, even, and certainly less harmful than excessive alcohol. So even though I couldn't handle it because I got, I liked it too much and had to stop. So I did stop, but I wasn't getting off playing the music I really loved. So I had to go, you know, hire the fancy limousines and this and that and get that. But now that, now that I'm playing what I love, the only thing I'm still hooked on are the good restaurants I learned about when I was making this kind of money. That has never left me. But outside of that, I'm a very simple guy. I don't require much of anything. And uh, the um, so to me, the thing that's important in life, in life is having a passion for something and really loving it. And the gigs, some of the gigs I enjoy the most. I might be playing off a bucket where they're collecting the money in a little tiny club where I know nobody can make any money. There are other times when I make a lot of money. 
and there are sometimes I enjoy it. But most of the times, the best jobs are the ones where you're playing exactly what you want to play for a limited audience that wants to hear it. Talking about the spinning wheel solo, which I know you'd want me to talk about, we went into the studio, and I played what I thought was the first solo, which I thought was my best one. I, I don't know if I, I probably could hear it if I it's called Roy Halley, who probably has the tapes somewhere. Someday I might, out of curiosity. Um, and then David said to me, loved it, Lou, except could you do me a favor? Just start off with the melody. Play a few bars of the melody and then do what you want. So hence I started it, da 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 and then I went off. Hmm. Because he said to start with the melody. And uh, everything else was totally improvised. It was the second take. The solo was criticized. I, I didn't think it was that good a solo. I was very uptight and very insecure about the way I played at that point because I was coming out of the jazz world and I thought that the music I was playing with Blood, Sweat and Tears was making my jazz playing, was hurting my jazz playing. And it was. There's, that, that's just the way it is. Anything that you do that's not completely pure and right to yourself is harmful to you as far as your art. And I will go on record as saying, including the studio work. And I'll tell you a story about that. But being aware of it can save you. If you're aware of it, it can save you. That's a really good uh, point. And I talk about it a lot in my own clinics. Awareness is an amazing thing. And it's, sometimes that can be the, uh, that can be a, uh, like you're saying, that could save you. Um, let's, I really appreciate all that, the great insight in, about that time in your life. Let, um, let me just tell you one thing that happened yeah, with the solo. Yeah. So, um, I thought the solo was okay. I didn't think it was terrific, but the thing that made me aware of it is that when, and, and you know, it was cut out of the single, the solo was cut out of the single, but it didn't matter because enough people liked it. Usually people play the record with the solo anyway, even on the air. And the fact that it was on the air is why people began to like it because they began to be familiar with it. And I believe that DJs could make any music popular that they chose to. I believe whatever is played on the air and people hear enough, they will like. I really do believe that. I mean, to a large extent. To a large extent, if it's fed to them enough, so the reason my trumpet solo lasted, I cannot believe I still hear the thing on the radio. I cannot believe it. Is because it was played a lot on the air. Um, well, it's, it. an, it's, a, it's an interesting thought. I mean, I, I think it's, I think personally, I think it's a great solo and I think it's a great tune. Thank and, you. and there was... You I know, always loved the tune. I always loved the tune. It just a lot of elements came together for that. So it's it's. But I I, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, you mentioned the New York studio scene, which I'd like to touch on that a little bit sure. before we get to uh, to Gil. To Gil. Um, you know, you got back to New York in 1973, and and you know, arguably one of the great studio careers of all time. Maybe you could touch on you know what it was like being that busy and the, what the scene was like, in particular in the 70s, but also Easy. the 80s and, and Easy. 90s as well. Easy. Easy answer. Um, as I said, Alan Rubin was one of my best buddies. This, you got to hear. I'm sorry to be this way, but you got to hear this. <laughs> At the time Blood, Sweat and Tears was forming, Alan wanted to form a brass quintet where he picked five players for their tones. He wanted me, Dave Taylor, Tony Price on tuba, Peter Gordon on French horn, and himself. He picked us for our tones. We played a Carnegie Hall concert. I remember talking to the great trumpet player, Tom Listenby. I don't know if you know who he is. No, I Played don't. principal with New York City Ballet. Mm -hmm. Played principal with Kutserkabau for a while. Uh, now retired. Uh, he's now writing books. Uh, and I said, hey, Tom, we're forming a brass quintet. You can use this or lose it. <laughs> but Tom. I told him the person that I said, Alan Rubin, Peter Gordon, Dave Taylor. Uh, 
Tony Price and me. And he fell on his back laughing. And I said, what are you laughing about? And he said, you guys are all comedians. You'll never play. <laughs> we did a Carnegie, we rented Carnegie Hall recital hall. And Alan Rubin, as nervy as he is, as nervy as he is, he hated to play alone. He hated to play by himself. It made him nervous. So we're playing along, and he has some low stuff in a straight mute, and I hear this on stage. Uh, 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 uh. And it struck me funny. So I go <laughs> like that as I'm playing. This is on stage at Carnegie High Saddle Hall. And then I hear, I go, <laughs> and then, around then I hear, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hear this. And then it happened. Then I gave another one, and I hate to say it, I know, I know we're all very um, uppity in the brass world, but a snot bubble came out of my left nostril, which was on the interior, thank heaven, not for the audience to see. But the rest of the band saw it as I was suppressing a laugh, and that was it. The band <laughs> folded, we were hysterical, laughing, rolling on the floor. It was the last recital we ever tried to play. We just cried and got off the stage. <laughs> it was the end of it. Well, I didn't think the word snot bubble was going to come up in the interview, but well, well here you go. You know, you know. <laughs> I mean, it, what the hell? It was, it was hysterical. So getting into the studio scene, it was the very man, Alan Rubin, who was my best friend since I was 16 and he was 17, who waited for me until I got out of Blood, Sweat and Tears. And when I got out of Blood, Sweat and Tears in 1973, Alan got me into the studio scene. Mm, okay. Alan got many people into the studio scene. Alan helped more people than you would believe mm. get into the scene, get big gigs as contractors as whatever. He helped many people. And sometimes those people turned on him mm. and didn't remember. Mm. And it was just a drag. But Alan always remembered. Uh, and so Alan got me right into the studio scene. I would always make, in my mind, I would always make what I called jazz at that time, which I don't call jazz anymore, which I now call improvised chamber music, my priority. So I would always run out of town with Gil Evans, or I would run out of town with this one or that one. And um, so I was never around all the time, which is what you had to do to really be busy, busy in the studios. And I'll tell you another thing I used to do. I used to come five minutes late to some jingle dates until my coat was pulled to it. So for those of you who, who are interested in doing that kind of work, if it ever comes back, which I don't know if it ever will, but if it ever, I'm sure, I'm sure it will, things run in cycles. I was five minutes late in a business where it was like an hour with a possible 20. And if it went over the possible 20 and you were five minutes late, it could be your fault. So I remember that I was a member of a band called the Manhattan Jazz Quintet with David Matthews. I was in that band for a long time, 27 years. And one day in the early days of the band, David, when there was still a lot of jingle work, says, Louie, I, I have a jingle for you next Thursday at 10 in the morning. But I'm telling you, Louie, if you're late, I'll never use you again. I said, what are you talking about? When am I late? He said, well, you were three minutes late on this date. You were five minutes late on that. You were seven minutes late on that. You were th three minutes late on the other. I said, five minutes makes that much difference? He says, Louie, yeah. Hmm. So I started coming on time to dates. And within three or four months, I was as busy as any trumpet player in New hmm. York. It's good advice. Yeah, within, be and within three or four months, I was as busy as any trumpet player in New York in the studio business. Um, but what Gil Evans told me, I'm going to tell you, I keep a lot of the stuff he says secretive. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to tell you his exact words. 
But a few, for those of you who, who want to be artists, who are aspiring to be real artists in the sense of trying to get where, where, where somebody like Gil got, or somebody like Miles got, or somebody like, like um, Winton, because to me he's a great artist. Um, you know, and other people that I'm not mentioning. There's no question or either of the Brecker brothers may Michael rest in peace. I'm sure that they would agree with me that when the studio work died down, their playing opened up more because they didn't have to be, in Gill's words, it was very simple. I remember I played a concert with him in Italy and I thought I was playing a pretty good solo on a tune. And I stopped and in the band were Hannibal Marvin Peterson, if you don't know him, he's great, and George Adams, who may rest in peace, was great. And Hannibal used to get in front of the band, take his shoes off, get down on his knees and play. And George would just take it out. And I remember Gil saying to me, I said to Gil after the concert, I said, Gil, I said, and this was one year after I'd left Blood, Sweat and Tears. This was 1974 in Europe. I said, um, I thought I had something going on Thoroughbred, which was a Billy Harper term. And he said, yeah, he said, why did you stop? And I said, I don't know, Gil. I wish I could be uninhibited like Hannibal or George. And Gil said, well, you know, that's kind of hard to do when you're a studio musician. And I said, but Gil, I only do about three dates a week. How many studio musicians wish they were doing three dates a week now, <laughs> right? But in those days, in those days, a brass player who was busy would be doing 16, 18 dates a week, sometimes 20. And uh, a busy rhythm player would choose his favorite 25 out of 40. Mm. You know, it was really, really busy. So I said, but Gil, I only do three week dates a week, he says. Doesn't matter. He said, when you do that, you have to be professional even if it was three dates a week. And when you did professional, when you were professional, you couldn't be creative. Now, it took me many years to understand what he really meant by that. Uh, and I also want to qualify this whole thing that I'm talking about and say that I'm extremely thankful for the studio work I did. Um, and that that's what I did because I was not, and am not a purist, but for the purists, the only, the only answer for the purists is to be pure. And, and, and the, you know, and some of the greatest artists, the only ones that's, that really succeed in the pure artists are the ones that have the incredible courage to do that, which I did not, okay? I did not, but I do now because I can, because I did the studio work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I'm pursuing it. But I'm saying for the very few of you out there who, who uh, can do this, if you believe strongly enough, enough in yourselves and you work hard enough, and that second part is essential at what you really want to do, you can do it. I believe it's about 5% talent and 95% hard work, perseverance, intention, whatever you want to call it. That's what I believe it is. Very strongly. Five, not 10% talent, 5%, but essential talent. And then 95% sheer willpower and perseverance and intensity of wanting to constantly improve and go more towards a, a pure goal of whatever it is that you, that you want. For everybody, it's different. Anyway, so at that point, where I was wanting to be a, a, real a real improviser 
in Gil Evans' band, who was the epitome of, you know, a, a pure artist. Um, Gil said to me, and from the, the point of view of a pure artist, he was right, that when you're professional, you can't be creative. Professional meaning in the sense of studio work, that when you're a studio musician, you do what you have to be able to do what they want you to do. If they want you to play it this way, you play it that way. If you want them, to, if they want you to play it this way, you play it that way. If they say long, short, it's long, short. If they say short, long, long, it's short, long, long. That's professional. That's very, very important to be professional when you're doing that work. But when you're creative, it's very, very important to be yourself. And as a band leader, now, I take a cue from Gil, and I hire musicians, and I don't tell them how to play. I want them to be themselves. And if I don't like what somebody's doing, I get somebody else. I don't tell them how to play. I just get somebody else. Hmm. That's all. And, you know, and making change is also very important, unless somebody's extremely versatile and can change with the way your music changes. So in that sense, in the sense that Gil was talking about professionalism and, uh, and uh, creativity, if you understand what I mean, I'm not knocking the studio scene. One of the joys I had of it was playing with some of the greatest musicians on earth, walking into, walking into a date with Randy and Michael Brecker and Alan Rubin and John Faddis and, uh, and Alan Rubin and John Faddis and, uh, you know, God knows who else. Wayne Andre. And Wayne Irby Andre, Green and, Irby yeah. Green. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and these players that played their instruments on a level of, of some of them on a level in a different way of the, of the same level that major symphony players played there. As a matter of fact, there was, the field was so lucrative that uh, a notable example is the great David Nadian, who quit his job as concertmeister with the New York Philharmonic so he could make more money playing in the studios. A lot more money. And uh, Wasn't you know, that, didn't that happen to Alan as well? I thought he was close to being a member of the Philharmonic at some point and he just decided no, to stay. No, but David Taylor, that. David Taylor turned it down. Hmm. David Taylor turned the Philharmonic down, in essence. He was, <coughs> I can't go on record saying it was official, but I know they really wanted him to audition. Mm. They really, mm. really wanted him to audition. And you know how great he would have done the job. Of course. Yeah. No, Alan, Alan never wanted that. Alan, Alan was like me with that. He didn't like being pointed. You can play this note. <laughs> you know, I don't want that. But it, but I love the music, and now, you know, now I play in a brass quintet called the Manhattan Brass, and I have so much fun, you know, I really do. Anyway, I just want to make it very clear that I'm grateful what the studio scene did for me, um, and, and I'm, you know, and I'm not trying to be uppity about it or put it down at all. I'm just saying that, in my experience, the few guys I've seen that pursued their pure art without compromise through their careers have been the most successful, notably Winton. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another whole different thing, Chuck Mangione. And um, uh, now it's a very rough world out there to be a jazz musician because part of the success of the jazz musician I'm using it for lack of a better word, is selling records. There's no stores you can buy into rec to, you can buy records in now. And it's a really tough situation now. It's tough. Yeah. Hey, Lou, I want to um, just steer back a little bit. We, you talked about you know, uh, the great advice that you got from Gil. I know you've described Gil as your musical godfather. He clearly had a, yes. has a huge impact on you. I'd like for you to you know, just... Maybe talk about some of the most uh, positive things that you experienced with Gil, the things that you, if you had one, two or three memories of yes. being in the band, what would, okay. what would those be that, that you took away from uh, playing his great music? When I started playing with Gil Evans, 
I was afraid to play a note. I was always afraid. I was very shy about soloing. And Johnny Coles and Gil helped teach me that notes are really only approximation of what the music is when you're playing really creative music. And you have to relax and swing the parts and, you know, and phrase them in a... In other words, Gil had a different concept uh, which I could bring in graphic results to, uh, say, even a unison. Say a unison in a Count Basie band or the way the Count Basie band plays everything exactly together is one thing. And the band is so great that it's a thrill to listen to it. And that's the kind of thing that a lot of studio music was based on. The, the tightness and this and that of the Count Basie band. But unfortunately, not the looseness of it, which it also had. Um, the band that, that Gil stemmed more out of was the Ellington band, where it was written more for like a unison meant not everybody playing the exact same pitch, but the sound that happened from everybody playing their individual sense of what a note was created a different kind of unison that was so soulful that it, it's hard to, <coughs> more akin to the human voice to me. Hmm. And uh, so I started to think of music that way. Another bit of advice Gil gave me when I was young, which was, Gil, I don't know what to do. You know, when I was real young, I said, I like to play so many different types of music, I don't know what to do. You know, I like to play this, I like to play that, I like to play that. He said, well, Lou, he said, what I would advise you is take the path of least resistance. In other words, instead of working the hardest on your weak points, work the hardest on your strongest points, because that way your strongest points can become exceptional. Whereas if you work on your weakest points, you will get good at them. But if you take what comes naturally to you, and I finally realized that what comes nat most natural to me is not playing jazz, quote unquote, you know, it's two things. It's playing lead, but not, it's phrasing the lead and being able to lead a band, but not, not in the sense of being the loudest and highest player and just being able to you know, phrase it and listen to it. And my method of doing it is very simple. I don't play lead. I listen to what the band is playing, fit in with them, and before you know it, they're following me. That's what I do. Hmm. Instead of trying to lead them and dictate to them. I never tell anybody how to phrase anything. The, unless somebody is being obvious and holding a you note know, two beats longer than I'm holding it, four times in a row, then I'll say, oh, by the way, would you please <laughs> cut that off on such and such. But at, at any rate, and, and, and improvising, I love to improvise. Bebop was not my biggest strength. I can play it, but my biggest strength is improvising in my own way. And so I finally learned to develop that. A simple thing like not being drawn to learning chord changes in great de depth in the academic sense. It isn't the way that I enjoy playing. I enjoy basically trying to paint. If, if I would give you my theory on improvising, that I got a lot from developing it from playing with Gil, it's the most important thing is the intention, soul, feeling, story, however you would want to put it. Then after that, what most people forget about, which Gil didn't taught me, but I came to, tone. Hmm. Most people forget about tone. They learn how to play a million notes, but they don't realize that the thing that grabs an audience, that grabs people, that communicates between you and others, is the sound you produce on an instrument. I don't care if it's a drum or a piano or a horn. You know, and, and then, Rhythm, rhythm, the, the intensity of the rhythm and trying to be as strong rhythmically as a drummer, even though you play a horn 
And then after that, what notes you play. And you've all heard free players, and if the rhythm, the intention, and the sound is strong enough, it almost doesn't matter what note somebody's playing, as long as they resolve once in a while. But that's not from Gill, that's, that's my theory of playing. But at any rate, the, the, the thing that Gill told me, there are things he told me I'll never tell anybody, but one of the things I can tell you is, one, one time, about once a year, he'd pull me aside and he'd tell me something. One time he said, you know, in my band, high does not necessarily mean loud. He said, you should listen to the way Miles plays on the Duke on Miles Ahead to hear what I'm talking about. You know, and um, he hated technical display. He hated it. I remember once I was playing in Europe. This was funny, so I can tell you the funny ones. I was playing in Europe, and this beautiful girl walked in the room, and all of a sudden I started playing. <laughs> We walk backstage, Gil says, what the hell were you doing? I said, I don't know, this pretty girl walked in. He says, that's what I thought, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then in another time, on my own record, I thought I played my ass off on something, and Gil said, that was all technical display. He said, do it again. This is one of the deepest. I can't tell it, won't let me tell it. But, um, but um, I can say it this way. I'm, I'm now studying acting as a hobby, okay? And uh, I'm really, I'm more than a hobby, I'm really enjoying it. And one of the things the acting coach says, he, he says there's one emotion, and this goes back to Gil, one emotion that you don't want to display. You can display depression, you can display this, that, but don't display real sadness because then it becomes morose. Gil taught me the same thing about music. <laughs> you know, it's already in there. If you're sad, it's already in there. <laughs> you don't have to, oh man, I'm gonna show how sad I am, man. You don't have to be like that, it's in there. You know, like, like Errol, uh, uh, wow. When my father passed away back in um, 1982, shortly after it, I was up at uh, McKell's and I ran into Eric Gale. And I told, told him, you know, my dad passed away and this and that. And Eric just said, that's the blues. Mm. You know, and uh, other things that Gil did, Gil, I can say this one. I once watched a clinic, he gave a clinic, and we watched him. And they said, Gil, what's the first thing you think about when you're writing for five trumpets, four trombones, five saxes, you know, and rhythm? What's the first thing you think about? He says, well, the first thing I think about is trying to not make it sound like five trumpets, four trombones, and you know, and this and that. And I saw tears streaming down Maria Schneider's face when they first found the real orchestrations of Porgy and Bess and Miles Ahead, which were in the possession of Miles's lawyer somewhere in a basement. I don't even think he knew he had them. And we were rehearsing them with the Carnegie Hall Band. And when we realized that nobody, no matter how good their ears is, nobody who tried to trans transcribe it ever got it right. They would think it was a French horn. It could be a cup muted trumpet and a flute. Nobody could figure out what that man did. So Maria, when we played it down, she tears were streaming down her face. I remember that. Gill was, I never, I think he was as much of a genius as Miles. And I think Miles thought so too. And um, I, I was just so fortunate to work with him. He taught me a lot. When I would warm up, you know, when I would be, you know, it would make me good trumpetistically, I would warm up with a lot of trumpetistic warm up. He would say, don't play that diatonic shit in front of me, you know? So it taught me that, you know, and then later when I studied with Arnold Jacobs, Arnold Jacobs said to me, 
Only one third of your practice should be technical. Two thirds should be musical. Even better, one quarter and three quarters. Otherwise, you wind up, you wind up sounding like a technician rather than a musician. One funny thing that happened is there was a guy that was practicing. Sorry if you're still, if you hear this guy, but there was a guy that used to practice eight hours a day trumpet where Gil lived in his building. So one night Gil hired him. It was nothing because all the guy did was practice trumpet exercises eight hours a day. Gil got stuck one <laughs> night and hired him. You know, it was all exercises. You got to practice music. You want to play music, you got to practice music. And uh, just getting into some things, words of wisdom about brass playing that I learned from Arnold Jacobs. Get his book on breathing. And he always said to me, you have to have a horn in the head and a horn in your hand. In other words, when you're playing, you don't listen to yourself. You listen to the imagination of what you want it to sound like rather than listening to yourself. Then afterwards, you want to hear it back, you hear it back in your head. You want to get critical of it, you get critical of it, but not while you're doing it. You don't say, oh, is this okay while you're doing it? Or it can't, the message can't be there. The message can only be there if you're really positive while you're saying it. And, uh, and if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I hope this is good, I hope that people like it, you're cooked before you start. You're cooked before you start. You go, this is it. I hope you like it. If you don't like it, it's okay. But this is it. This is what I have to say tonight. So Gil was, I saw Gil turn down so many lucrative offers. It was crazy. Many, many big rock and roll people wanted him. It was crazy. He did elect to work with Sting because he did like Sting's music. He was, we were supposed to do an album. Miles and Gil and Jimi Hendrix were supposed to do an album together. I was supposed to be a part of it in the band. It never happened because Jimi died. We did a record, the music of Jimi Hendrix. It's a terrific record. And uh, um, I, never, I never learned more from anybody than I did from Gil, never. When he was pre present, when I did, <laughs> when I did my first solo recording, which was Hanalei Bay, and he didn't like the way I played the melody on something. It was the same one where he thought I used too much technical display. It was using a piccolo trumpet, which I take to piccolo trumpet in a very weird way. As much as I have trouble with certain technical things on trumpet on piccolo, I, I don't have much of a problem at all on many things. So Gil says, I don't like the way you played the melody on that. It sounded like you weren't warmed up. He said, see, him, see if you can have them cut that melody out. And I said, but Gil, I said, I don't know if they'll do that, you know? He says, tell them you'll sue them if they don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I said, Gil, you know what? They won't do it for me, but if you call them, they'll do it for you. <laughs> And Gil called him, and you hear that melody cut right out. <laughs> I'll play it for you sometime. <laughs> cut, it, cut the melody right out. What Gil said, people did. They had that kind of respect for him. They knew who he was. Elvin knew who, who he was, too. When he was there during my first record with Elvin Jones that I did, when uh, it was called Yesterdays, um, and Elvin at one point said, Anybody who doesn't listen to him is a fool or an idiot. I don't remember his word, but it's true. Yeah. Well, it's it's, it's so clear the, the impact that Gil had on you, and, and I'm sure on, on most people that had uh, a connection with him, he was one of the genius musicians. It was like another time. level. It was another level. It was like, it was like he was like the Obi-Wan Kenobi of jazz. Mm. A friend of mine told me that Miles had a picture of him in every room in his house and would, said, said someday people will know who this guy really wow. was. Wow, amazing. You know? Um, 
as we wind down, I want to talk about a couple more things, but I think I would be remiss in not mentioning the great Ornette Coleman. I know he's had a major impact on you as well, and I'd like you to maybe just touch okay. on your relationship with him. Well, you know, I believe in a lot of uh, mystical stuff, and I, 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 I really uh, let it direct my life in some ways. So, for example, my uncle plays me in Ornette Coleman, record, the one we all heard first, The Shape of Jazz to Come. I thought the record was warped. I really did. I thought the record was warped. I didn't understand the quarter steps or anything like that at all. But in the same breath, when he played it for me, I said, I have to play with this man someday. This is where I'm going. That thought hit me back then, even when I thought the record was warped. That's amazing. And I did play with him. And um, he is a friend of mine, and um, I should play with him more than I do. Uh, I have the invitation to, to, to play with him, and I should be doing it more. But he's so great. Frankly, he intimidates me. He's so great. Mm. But, you know, that's one of my problems. As I'm growing, I'm being less intimidated by the really great musicians. Anyway, going on. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody who, who couldn't be intimidated by Ornette Coleman. I mean, when it's just mind-boggling what he's uh, created. And, as well, I was intimidated with Gil, too, of course, and then I got to know him. And yeah. I'm, I'm less intimidated with Ornette now that I got to know him, but it's still like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> of course. Um, Lou, as we, as we wind down here today, I want to focus a little bit on your solo career. Um, you're very prolific. You've recorded eight CDs as a solo artist. You've got ensembles that you're leading and, and performing with all over the world. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you're going at this point as a solo artist? What's, what's driving you and what's inspiring you uh, to, okay. keep, to keep going forward? Well, there's two aspects. Uh, one is as a solo artist and one is with several other great ensembles I'm playing with. Um, uh, as a solo artist, I just had a, what I consider a career breakthrough. Um, I did a, uh, a concert in Tchaikovsky Hall in Moscow under my own name with a quartet um, with John michel Pilk on piano and Francois Moutin on bass and Ross Peterson. We've done several tours of Europe together. Ross Peterson on drums, brilliant young drummer. Uh, so we get to Tchaikovsky Hall. We did that and we did Philharmonic Hall in Krasnodar, another town, Krasnodar in Russia. We get to Tchaikovsky Hall, which is a 1,500-seat hall. You know, the last time I played in, uh, in Moscow was about 1991 or 1990 with the Mingus uh, Orchestra playing Epitaph. So I don't feel I have any name in Russia. Now, granted, there is, it is a subscription series with about 1,200 people in the subscription. But let's face it, everybody doesn't come to every concert on subscription series. Sure. So I do... I do I'm very thankful we sold the concert out. That's awesome. And that's the first time I ever sold a concert hall of that magnitude out with my under my own name at being the only act on the show. You know, uh, you know, in a festival it's a different story once in a while or whatever, but that's the first time for me. And the second concert was quite successful too. Uh, not sold out, but quite successful. Um, I also have a band that I co-lead with Ann Drummond a great flute player, and we, we have done a few things together. Uh, Ann and I went down and played with a great local rhythm section in Atlanta, Georgia, with both Kenny Banks Sr. and Kenny Banks Jr. on piano, a great drummer named Terry Ann Gully, who's world known, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, a great bass player who very people know, but they will, Kevin Smith. Uh, anyway, we had a ball playing at this little jazz club called The Velvet Note. I play uh, at the Zinc Bar, with Ann, and we use two different rhythm sections, depending on where we want to go. We usually use either Ross on drums and Mark Egan on bass and uh, Julio Carmasi, but we'll probably have to find a sub for him because Julio just went out with Pat Metheny as a multi-instrumentalist, and mm. he won't be around too much for the next year and a half. <laughs> right. And, uh, and um, also um, uh, Osnoy, the great Osnoy on guitar. Sure with Ann and I, uh, we do that when we want to, you know, play a lot of variety of stuff. 
And when we want to funk out more an intense funk, uh, we usually get Will Lee, who is, you know, come on, you know. One of the greats. One of the, I mean, so is Mark. In, yeah. In the, yeah, yeah. But, but they're both incredible in different ways. And, uh, and a drummer like Rocky Boyd or Keith Carlock or something like that, mm, you know. Wow. And, well, there is nothing like that. We either get Rocky Boyd or Keith Carlock or, you know, anyway. Uh, so those two things. But I've had a couple of experiences recently that are so great. To me, one of them was playing with Jeff Tane Watts' family, the Watts family reunion band, where everyone in the band was picked not only for the way they play, but because Jeff and Laura, Laura Kelly is his wife, who is, uh, to me, a genius uh, arranger composer. And she plays trumpet in the band too. Uh, a guy you probably never heard of, Kenyatta Beasley, who you might have heard of, plays trumpet. And he's terrific. Alexander Sipiagin, who's fabulous, plays trumpet. I'm playing lead in that band. But I also get to play. And Jeff and uh, David Budway, who is a fantastic piano player, and Paul Ballenbach, who's a fantastic guitarist, and a new kid on bass named Chris Smith. The saxophone section included Ravi Coltrane and Don Byron and Yosvani Terry and, uh, and Claire, Claire Daly on baritone and uh, a kid from Australia. I'm embarrassed to say his name is so hard for me to remember because it's an Australian name mm -hmm. who plays his butt off, of course. Robin Eubanks and, uh, and uh, Frank Lacey and Conrad Herwig on trombones with Scott Robinson playing bass saxophone instead of a tuba. The band was nothing short of phenomenal. And we're going to record probably next month, probably in March with them. Wow, fantastic. And uh, 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 other experiences I've had playing with... Uh, with, with, with uh, Oh, God. Um, other experiences I've had playing in small groups at the 55 bar, um, occasionally leading other small groups myself. Um, I'm having a ball. And the Manhattan Jazz Quintet, uh, not, not Manhattan Jazz Quintet, the Manhattan, Bre the Manhattan Brass is a band with Wayne Domaine, Dave Taylor, Mike Seltzer, and R.J. Kelly and myself. And uh, I have to say that we're playing a lot more jazz-oriented things now. We did a very interesting Christmas record. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm playing all over the place. Uh, I have ideas about doing a lot more solo work. Uh, and um, I'm just having such a great time. I just played with the Terry Gibbs reunion big band, uh, I'm playing with the Mingus big band a lot again now. Mm. After years of not playing with them a lot, mm. I'm now playing with them a lot, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to Europe uh, where I'm featured with the one of the best big bands I ever played with in my life, the Bohuslän big band, which is out of Gothenburg, Sweden, where I recorded in 2007. I recorded uh, Porgy and Bess with them. Mm. And um, if you haven't heard, I'll give you a copy of that yeah, sometime. I'd love to hear it. Love and uh, I'm also working with Stephen Richmond. Sometimes I recorded sketches of Spain uh, uh, as a solo with the what he calls the New York Harmony Ensemble. And uh, I did that a couple of years ago. And uh, we hope to be doing more with that band. There's a, an Ellington album coming out of the Nutcracker Suite, and an album of Peter Gunn coming out of that. Um, as I say, the Terry Gibbs reunion band led by his son, Jerry Gibbs. We just played with that. And uh, I don't know for sure. I have played with the Ellington Orchestra before. And there's a tour in the offing now, and we're negotiating, mm -hmm. where I might, be, I might be going with them in April to play with them uh, over Russia and Europe again. But I'm not sure. It has not been confirmed. Uh, so safe to say, even though let me be the first to wish you happy birthday, I believe you're turning. I'm turning the, seventy. The big I seven zero in a couple it. of weeks. February twentieth. Let us all uh, get the Can't inspiration that you've given us, uh, and and you continue to play at the highest level and do this amazing work. And you're just there's no stopping you, and your artistry is coming out, and uh, it's uh, 
It's an, an inspiration to all of us, brass players and musicians I would, alike. I would like to say this just in closing, because I know we talked about me in his interview. One of the big influences to me is the way David Taylor keeps going and pushing and practicing. Mm. And I do the same. Mm -hmm. I go and I push and I practice, and I will never be satisfied with the way I play. It's an amazing approach, and, and we, we should all absolutely learn from that. Lou, I just want to give you a big thank you uh, for taking the time out today, for allowing us into your lovely home here in Williamsburg. Uh, you know, obviously, continued success and, and the amazing work that you're doing, and uh, we look forward to just following what you do in the, in the years to come. It means a lot to me, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, Lou. We will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick. Thanks for joining us.